Episode 68, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, Novel vs. Film. Greetings, Point Blank listeners. This is Justin, and as always, my co-host on this wonderful podcast, Kurt. How are you doing, Kurt? I'm doing good, Justin. Uh, I'm glad we, we switched around the intro here a little bit uh, today because we're doing a slightly different episode uh, for today's show. Uh, we're going to look at the film version of The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And I don't know about you, Justin, but I think I think this episode, we're not film critics. This episode is mostly like a reaction video <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, we're reacting to this film after having dove into the book read the book, and and analyze the book. So that's how we're going to approach this one, uh, if that's all right with you. It's fine with me. I certainly don't want to do a straight film review because uh, I don't I don't have the language to do it effectively, and we've tried in the past, and they've been okay, but not great. So uh, I, I'm looking forward to uh, talking about this, this film briefly. It, it's a great film. Uh, we obviously uh, both enjoyed the book, having reviewed it recently. Uh, that was the, the last episode. This one will be significantly sh- shorter. Do we want to give a little bit of context for this film? Who's in it? Who directed it before we uh, proceed? Yeah, I think so, Justin. Um, before we do that, I wanted to do to give a shout out to uh, one of the friends of the show here. And that's uh, Marie. Uh, she she was recently, well, I should say she, t- she writes under um, at least her detective fiction under the pen name of N. Uh, Ravenel. Um, and she was nominated for a Seamus Award this year. Um, under the category of Best First P.I. Novel, and this was uh, for The Arrangement, which we covered a while back uh, on the program. So congratulations to her. Um, there, was only, uh, there was only five uh, nominees in this category. Unfortunately, she didn't win, but I think this is, you know, a Seamus is, is not a, a award to scoff at. So congratulations for the nomination. And as I remember the t- book, I really was drawn in by... Uh, by the main character, uh, which was, I got to look up here in my notes. Tootsie was the, the main yep. PI, uh, a black detective in 1970s New York city. And I liked the voice. Uh, I would like to see more, uh, from that character. So congratulations. And hopefully we'll see uh, more in this, uh, PI series. Of yeah. Books. Cheers, Marie. Well done. Yeah. Let's Justin, let's get into, to this, this movie. You know, if you're out there listening and you're expecting us to do an in-depth, Film history, film critique, we're not going to do that. Uh, there's plenty of other people who have covered this film. It's probably in, I don't know, probably in a lot of people's top 50 greatest American films of all yeah. time. You can find that there. Yeah, this is, this is a golden age classic. It's a film that is not arguably, but in fact, uh, decidedly better known than the book itself. There's a whole lot of text written about this book uh, over the past 70 plus years. Uh, it's one of Humphrey Bogart's uh, best pictures. Uh, John Huston, the director, this is one. This is him at, at peak Houston. Uh, the, the movie he did prior to this was The Maltese Falcon uh, w- with Bogart. Uh, his father, Walter Houston, stars uh, as Howard in this film. He won a, an Academy Award for that. The, this also won Academy for Direction and Screenplay. I mean, just up and down. The cinematography is stunning. Uh, all-star uh, cast with incredible performances. This is just a great film, whether or not you give a damn about B. Traven or Noir. And and I've seen it before, and I saw it just the other night again, and, and it definitely holds up. It's it's just a stellar uh, experience to, to, to be with these characters uh, on, on the so-called mountain uh, in their pursuit of gold. Uh, what were your uh, impressions of, of this film, having just read the book, Kurt? Well, seen this film before, as you have, and I, I think there's a, a couple of things. First, first of all, I really enjoyed watching it again after having the book fresh in my mind because it was fun to see some how much of the dialogue was taken directly from the book and how much uh, was changed. Because I mean, I think it's kind of almost a fifty-fifty split in a lot of ways. I think there's a few scenes, the visuals in this film is what influences my my take in the last episode that this is more of a noir uh, a book. 
I think after our discussion last episode, I think I'm willing to be more in your camp that the book has more hard-boiled elements to it. But some of the scenes and how they're shot in this, to me, really have some some pretty strong noir elements. And I think maybe it's some of those visuals that were in my mind that made me me think about that. But we can get into that in a little bit. But overall, like, just I think it was a real treat to go back to a classic film uh, with the knowledge of the book that it was based on and, and just enjoy it. Oh, yeah, I agree. Um, at the opening of the film, I, you know, I, I, I went into it with my radar up looking for parallels, looking for uh, themes or repetition from, from, the, from the novel. And I thought uh, for the start, you know, that first one third where, where the men are, are in Tampico and, and, and they're, they're doing their thing and, and they're unemployed, they're down and out, and they find each other uh, over the course of that first act. I think that I think the book is um, or the the film is quite faithful uh, to to the book in in that manner. Uh, the men are bump, bumming around town. They get they they get jobs at the oil derrick. They get fleeced by their boss. Uh, they kick the boss's ass. They face the consequences of being members of the unemployed working class in this moment when it's you know if you, if you don't have a job, uh, there's not much for you. There's no safety net other than panhandling or, or getting lottery tickets. Uh, the the scene with with the with the the young uh, the Mexican child uh, selling lottery tickets and Dobbs being at first incredibly reactionary and aggressive toward the child but then finally relenting um, I thought that was a great scene of tension uh, which which is essentially how I imagined it when I was reading reading the novel so that whole first part felt pretty pretty in line with 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 the novel would you agree or did you did you have a different take on that. I, I do have to agree that it really captured the essence of the novel. And I think that's one of the things that, where, you know, we kind of talked about um, the pacing of the novel, where this movie brings a, a faster pace to the narrative. Um, and that's because some of the work is obviously being done by the visuals and the character acting, or the acting, I should say, being done by by the cast. But I do think it really captures the essence. I thought it was well done. I liked how it accelerated us into the into the story a little quicker. Yeah. I agree. It was much faster. It's much faster. I mean, the, the book, it, it did feel like molasses slow. Travin was definitely taking his time to show us Mexico, to show us Tampico, to give us sort of an insider look at sort of how the oil industry is operating. It was, there was no rush at all, but this, this, the film method of sort of fast tracking us through most of the same scenes, but it, but at a faster rate felt, I don't know, more modern uh, and and more appropriate in in my eyes. Yeah. I also wonder like, you know, just because there's so much crossover in this era between um, crime fiction or just pulp fiction in general and Hollywood, I wonder if some of that pacing uh, carried over into this script like, okay, let's, let's move it along here. Let's modernize, uh, this pacing a little bit. Um, but I, I like that. I appreciate it that it, it got us into the broader narrative quicker. I also think that, and again, this is to how much work the actors themselves are doing just by their portrayal on the screen. You know, I think Dobbs comes across as darker right from the get go based on Bogart's, uh, acting and how he interprets the character on the screen. I think that's one thing. I think Howard also comes across as a little, a little more crazed. He, I think you see a little bit more of that gold fever in um, um, Walter Houston's uh, portrayal uh, of Howard, you know, and I think that projects, you know, that does a lot of the work on the screen that is, has to be done in words in the book. So I, I appreciated that. There's also an interesting little note about this that I have to thank the Facebook group, Hard Boiled Detective and Noir Fiction and Movies group. Um, there's a, a frequent poster there. J.R. Sanders posted an article just this morning, I think, about this film. And it talks about the, the fact that in this opening scene, uh, when Dobbs or Bogart goes to, you know, when he's panhandling around, the man in the white jacket, that's played by John yes. Houston, the director. Yeah. And this is actually Bogart's third film. Uh, I believe it's his third film with Houston. And so when the Maltese Falcon came out, 
that was really the movie that per- propelled both of their careers forward. So um, this symbolism of, of giving him a leg up uh, with, with, the, with the handout of the money has some actual connection between these two uh, actors as well. So I, th- I thought that was an interesting little fact. And normally I, I don't find those bits of Hollywood lore that interesting, but I did Yeah, hear. no, I, I like that too. I, I came across that and I appreciate those little moments. Uh, nice little cameo by the director. I think the first moment in the film when I felt that uh, there was a deliberate shift away from the book uh, in the reshaping of the screenplay was in the bandit shootout when the men... Yes. yes. Yeah, they, they get their supplies. They, 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 they you know, they... They get the lottery card uh, and put all their money together. They decide they're heading into the mountains and they're on the train and the train is attacked by bandits in the mountain. And uh, this is different from the novel where, where we don't see the bandits at all uh, until they're actually coming up the mountains to, to, uh, to uh, investigate the men in, in their mining claim. And then we get the story by the fourth man uh, Le- Lacaud tells the story of the bandits who rob a train and it's this very sort of involved deep tale that goes on for 15 or 20 pages that's the first time we see the bandits in the novel here we're getting them at the like quarter mark of the book when the men are setting off on their journey um, what did you think about that change did you like it or not I think this is again goes to a little bit of modernizing the pace of the plot that we talked about in the yeah. beginning, because here we see this the same tale with the elimin essentially the elimination of the parables uh, or the story within the sure. stories, and we see that rather than being told a story of something that has happened in the past, we see that as action on the screen, which obviously works way better for a movie, but it also is a little I think more familiar for the for a modern viewer or modern reader to see. Uh, the action unfold like that rather than be told about something that happened in the past. So I think it works really pretty well because um, (laughs) as we mentioned in our review of the book, like not a lot happens till at least halfway through the book, but here you get some action, right? uh, Probably, you know, being this area of Hollywood, it's probably almost right at the end of the first third of the film. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is really the role of Hollywood influencing and shaping how we digest our entertainment. Uh, There's the three-act structure. There's the expectation of holding the audience's interest right away. You don't want to lose the audience. You need to have that balance of of exposition and dialogue, of scene and and movement and little quiet interludes. So I feel like this was – we're so used to the Hollywood – expectations now we expect it in most of our fiction especially in something as as genre focused as as crime fiction and i think that's what we're seeing here this sort of migration away from from a book that can sort of uh, you know take us on whatever journey it wants and isn't uh, beholden to formula versus this this sort of movement toward making sure that the audience is uh, we're hitting the beats at the right moments that being said i think that i, I like how this bandits set up foreshadows what comes on later. Uh, it develops for me like a more visceral association between our protagonists and the bandits, given that the bandits now recur in all three acts of the movie. You see them here. You see them when they, you know, the attack is pretty much the bandit mm. battle at the mining camp. And then later on, Dobbs runs into him again in act three and, and we'll, we'll get to that. But, uh, but yeah, I, th- I liked it, but I also understand that this was is probably the Hollywoodification of, of the way that we've come to digest, you know, our fiction, really. This reminds me of a point. It, it came up, I think, for the first time right after this scene. But a point my, my partner Laura made about the film is how sort of strange the music is yeah. in it. And I think that speaks it speaks to an interesting point of how this is hard to classify because this this movie goes from like these happy uh, this happy music, almost funny music um, to sort of dark music and back and yeah. forth throughout the whole movie. That's not something I necessarily catch in films, but yeah. she does. Uh, so I thought that was a really really interesting point. And, and they go in in this scene with the bandits, they go from that sort of, this, the kind of sound from this era when there's tension um, to almost to like a whimsical music right after this where, you know, Hey, we just, you know, shot and killed three guys. Let's go back to planning and having a good time looking mm-hmm. for gold. 
<laughs> music's doing a little bit of heavy lifting to uh, you know shape our emotional expectations, I guess. As it does in film all the time. But I think what's interesting here is that like now we like one of our other comments was you would never see that transition or would it be very, not never, but it would be rare to see that kind of transition of music in a film today uh, where you would, it would be building uh, the tension. The music would be building. Yeah. That almost seems like like bipolar, uh, you know, that it's the extremes uh, and which might be something like, capturing the 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 way that Dobbs is sort of wavering back and forth between you know uh, lucidity and, and absolute fucking madness let's talk about that for a second Justin because I think that's a good point I think I do th- I did write down while I was watching this that I did think that the film captured especially Dobbs's descent into madness a better than the book did that's probably through, I mean, it's a lot of that work is being done by Bogart's delivery, yeah. but I, it, it seems like that, that happens a little quicker. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, well, I mean, for one, the, the, the plot happens quicker. So we, we get to that point, but we get to see the unraveling uh, in the way that Dobbs speaks in the way that he communicates. Yeah. He's got this, you know, bug up his ass, all the way from the get go, you know, he's, he's ornery from the start. He's never relaxed. He's, he's, I mean, why would he be? He's, he's an unemployed worker. He, he's down and out. He's scrambling for change. But then, I mean, not long after Howard, you know, proposes the mine and seduces him with, with these images and ideas, you know, sugar plums in his head, laying in the bed, listening to Howard give his story about the Agua Verde mine. Um, yeah, you, you see the descent fairly quickly. Um, and, and I mean, I think the visceral nature of, of Bogart's performance has a lot to do with that because he's he is on fire in this in this book or I'm sorry, in this film. He's I mean, he's just he's his performance is, is tremendous, I think. Yeah, I would agree. I, I really I was looking at a picture of him, too, and of between um, Maltese Falcon and this film, which. Uh, basically, the, what is it, the timeline? Maltese Falcon comes out either right at the beginning of World War II or something, and this is after. Um, but his his face in this, he looks older, he looks rougher, and I don't think that's just the uh, makeup uh, talking. Um, but yeah, I think he I think he does quite well yeah, in here. I, I also read that he he was literally he had lost his hair, and his partner, um, oh Lauren Bacall, uh, she is reported as. T- saying that uh, at this time he was drinking so heavily uh, and there was a, apparently he had a vitamin B deficiency and it was causing all of his hair to fall out. So by the time he got to filming Treasure of the Sierra Madre, he like had no hair on his head. It had all fallen out from this vitamin slash alcoholism issue. And and all three of the men actually Yikes. wore wigs. So it wasn't an issue. They just put on these sort of dirty, muddy wigs and they got progressively more dirty and muddy as the, as the as the uh, as the movie went on, so we didn't really notice. So uh, he he was dealing with health issues clearly, which probably might have, uh, in in addition to the war and and how that sort of ravages our hearts and minds, that might have uh, contributed to his uh, his his performance. He must have been pretty surly on uh, on set because. Um... You know, again, not to go down the rabbit hole of stories from the set, but there's a a thing where I guess Bogart filming on this took way longer um, than expected, uh, in part because apparently it was one of the first like big Hollywood productions to be shot on location. And a lot of it was actually actually shot um, in Durango, in in Tampico, Mexico. But, But apparently Bogart, who was a big sailor, he wanted to get to this this regatta or whatever in Hawaii and it filming was taking a long time and he kept complaining to Houston about, about it. And apparently the director grabbed him by the nose and tweaked his nose and said something about it's going to take as long as it takes or something like that. And then he, he shut up about it. Um, But I thought that was, (laughs) I thought that was, yeah, he had a Houston had to bring him back to sort of slap him back into reality. Too, too much. Well, just the idea of somebody grabbing Bogart by the nose. And doing yeah, that. I imagine there's not. Hollywood's a different yeah, place. There's probably not many people who could get away with that. I wanted to say another another moment in the film that that deviates from from the book uh, that I thought was was a good move. And people might disagree, but I thought it was good. 
it's this moment, you know, like there's this fourth man, of course. The, the men get up to the mine and, yeah. and they're doing their thing and everything's pretty straightforward, pretty much by the book. Uh, but then, uh, you know, curtains down in, in the town and he, and, he, and he runs into this other prospector who's nosy and, and it sort of follows him up the mountain. Nobody wants him there. In the book, he's, his name is something like Lacaud, but in, 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 the, in the film, his name is Cody. And uh, this guy, they actually originally wanted Ronald Reagan to play this guy, uh, and that didn't happen. But the Cody relationship is a little bit different in this, in that, uh, well, for one, it's they're with him pretty. It's pretty pretty fast. They they go from, you know, get out of here to you have a night to okay, we've made our decision. We're either going to kill you or send you on our way. They essentially decide uh, to that they're going to they're going to kill him. Uh, but then just at that moment, yeah, the bandits yeah. come. And, and then after that, Cody gets killed by the bandits. And, and then we find this letter. And this whole sequence is very different from, from the book in a way that, that adds a lot more tension and a lot more meaning, I think, to the character of Cody and ultimately to the, to the end of the book as well. I would also say this pretty drastically for me changes the nature of Howard and Curtin as yeah. well. In the book, they basically, I mean, they agree that they're going to work together on this project. He just can't get any of the already uh, acquired gold. Mm -hmm. But here in in the film, they're just going to, okay, we'll murder him. Yeah. You know, (laughs) I guess we, I guess we got to, got to kill him. So it essentially sets sets up this, this need. If they're going to have a redemption arc for anybody, they need to redeem somebody because now they've all agreed to murder a guy in cold blood. Uh, and how, how do you, how do you, yep. how do you make any of these characters likable after that? Dobbs is hopeless, uh, but what do we do with Curtin and Howard? So, so both of them end up with these redemption arcs that to get them out of this, this pretty dark space. This is the part that really, I think, spiritually breaks from the book. Mm-hmm. Um, the other things I think are more, more questions of pacing and, and just plotting. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. Like, I think it does work. I think maybe it's because it makes it a little cleaner of a, of a plot, maybe because it makes it a little cleaner of what the morals uh, are of the, of the book or of the film rather. Maybe it makes it a little bit more genre defined or something like that. But I, I would agree with you. I think it works. I think that the only part of it that I did find a little hokey was the, the letter from his wife which I understand why it's there, but after he's killed, they, you know, for some, he's killed in the shootout with the bandits, not by them. They were going to murder him about an hour before this all happened. He was doomed. Um, Uh, Either way, he he was not going to make it through the night. (laughs) Yeah. So they had this moment where, oh, well, we didn't shoot him, but the bandits did. So now we're going to feel sorry for the guy. Um, And then we'll open up his wallet, find this letter from his wife, um, and then find out he has a young child. And, well, and this is also kind of, I mean, I guess I'm going to give away a little bit of the ending here, which is fine, whatever. It's an old movie. But, um, you know, at the end of the film, Curtin's like, well, yeah, I guess I'll go, you know, try to go up to Texas and break the bad news to his widow. And, you know, maybe I can make put the moves on her and There's get a his farm. Bit. And yeah, there is that. I, well, I, Howard actually sort of encourages it because Howard's like at the end, he's he's got yeah. his yeah. his like indigenous paradise where they've they've elected him as as like council and legislature and doctor and it's a little hokey but it's in the book uh but anyway he's got his character arc he's he's been a good guy and he gets this sort of he gets to be vindicated in his goodness so to speak and and curtain and he's like so what about you curtain why don't you take this letter and go check out texas and and curtain's like oh yeah maybe i will uh so it it, it sort of completes his redemption back to uh, you know sort of confronting that guilt he might have had over that decision and, and finding finding a resolution and sort of uh, completing that arc and, and, and acting as a surrogate for Cody. Uh, it's it's almost too Hollywood sickly sweet. Uh, it would have been worse if they actually filmed him in Texas, like, uh, you know, with, with the lady in yeah, his arms, yeah. you know. Yeah, that would have been worse. <laughs> it was bad. En- it was bad enough to see how they de- depicted Howard uh, in you know this idealistic situation with the indigenous community. And like, I thought that was like, I don't think the book's depiction is that bad. Um, but the, the film's version was a little, yeah, 
I don't know, product of its time, but it. I yeah, I mean, frankly, I didn't like it in the book either. I mean, it ju- it's just a white savior thing, which is just too many, too many alarms going off for me. But if we if we accept the context sure. of the time it was written, yeah, I mean, the movie definitely played up the whole. It's this like indigenous tiki hut paradise kind of thing. Yeah, he's sitting there, looks like almost like a hammock, having fruit fed to him by young women while people splash in a pool behind him. I mean, it's Eden garden of Eden. So I guess we're getting to the end of the film uh, here. So do you have any overall thoughts on this? No, I don't. (laughs) I have more, I have more little thoughts. (laughs) Okay. Well, anything you want to share? Yeah, sure. There's a couple more things I want to say about differences that I noted that, that, that spoke to me. The thing about the fourth man, Cody, Cody dying, the letter, uh, take it or leave it. I, I liked it. Um, I thought I thought it was good writing in terms of plot creation in giving character arcs. Um, mm-hmm. And then we have this act three where Dobbs is going down the mountain road with his donkeys. And this is the third time that we're confronted with the bandits. The bandits do not accuse him of using sand to duplicit to duplicitously load the scales for the hide merchants like they do in the book. At first I was mad that they, they left that out, uh, that they, that's what angered the bandits. They're like, you're no better than us. You're, you're a cheater and a liar too. Uh, and, and then Dobbs doesn't survive. Uh, in this case, in the movie, he's they, the, the original cut of the film shows him being beheaded. And the uh, film studio was like, hell no, uh, no beheadings. And, and, and and Bogart was sort of annoyed by that. He's like, what's wrong with the beheading? Uh, I agree. But but obviously there's a little bit of irony in that, too. Uh, I think they, they wanted to clean it up. So um, so they don't show a beheading. They show they show Bogart or, or Dobbs get, getting hit with a cutlass a couple times. But you do see the remnants of the beheading because you see the the, the bandits for a moment. There's a scene, just a short one, where they're watching something move across <laughs> the ground, but you can't see what it is. And then later on, you notice in the pond that there's a little bit of a ripple. That's Dobbs's head, but you never see it. So you just have, you're left guessing. Well, I wonder what happened. Maybe it's a turtle. Well, no, it's a head. So, so that was an interesting shift, which mm. isn't a big idea or a big deal, but it's a censorship thing um, that I thought was interesting. Uh, but ultimately, uh, those were the big moments for me that, that, that I thought were distinct I like the end. Um, let's talk about the ending, the, the way that they come back out looking for the bags of gold and, and the wind, the norther blows, and, and they, I like that. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was good. I, you know, I think um, one thing that about that scene that was a little, I felt less clear about in the film is why the bandits didn't realize that was gold. Um, we we are explained that in the book, like in kind of more detail than maybe even we want to know about about the goat about the sand and the dust and it doesn't look like gold but like without color and everything like you're like well okay that must be all glittery gold why didn't they realize that was gold and that was something that Laura asked me about when we watched this yeah. so I, I don't think that that was clear in the film but yeah otherwise I I, I did like that I, I like the fact I like the fact also that they filmed that um, at some runes instead of in the book being like just outside of town. I thought that was nice placement. Yeah. I don't know if you saw this. It, it is on the in the uh, Wikipedia article on this film, but uh, they used some jet engines from the Mexican Air Force to create the, the ah, wind. Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's quite a wind. Um, I, I did I did note that they didn't over explain the gold thing, but uh, in some of the dialogue that was in Spanish, they they kept referring to it as sand, as in looking like sand. Why are there these bags of sand? So I just presumed that it, it looked fairly sandy, uh, and not and not shiny, uh, to, to the to the bandits, and, and that that explained it enough for me. Uh, but yeah, they didn't really. Let me ask you about that because that brings up a, a point. Um, did your version of the film have subtitles for the Spanish? Yeah, it, you know, it had subtitles in Spanish. It was so yeah. There was there was no there was no translation. <laughs> it was Spanish verbally in Spanish visually. Oh yeah. Okay. Which, which was interesting because I, I thought I was surprised. I didn't remember this from previous viewings of this film, but I was surprised at what percentage of the dialogue was done in Spanish. And that did 
that did surprise me for a film of this era. I thought it would be, you know, the sort of typical broken English that you, you hear. Yeah. In this, yeah. Spanglish. That's terrible. Uh, yeah. yeah. With, yeah, well, I mean, for the good thing was that uh, many of the actors appeared to be or were Mexican natives, uh, locals yeah. acting, and and the yeah, and the Spanish was legit and and untranslated. That's some Cormac McCarthy level uh, refusing to accommodate the audience, uh, which I appreciate for sure. It it is unusual for the for the time period. They had some issues with um, filming locally, and one of the reasons you see so many folks who are from that area as extras is the, they had permission to film. Then the local government shut it down. Then they realized that, you know, maybe they didn't connect with the right people. And then, so they settled on the fact that they would hire local folks um, at $2 a day, which was considered good wages at the time for that area. Um, And that's why you do see a lot of, a lot of people who are actually from Durango uh, in Uh the film. That's great. So, uh, if you had to uh, pick, would you would you choose the book over the film, or vice versa, or is that is that too much of a? That's a tough question, Justin, because I think they do different things. I like the film structure from the scope of this podcast being crime fiction. I think the film has more to teach us uh, in the realm of crime and hard boiled fiction than the book does. The book probably. Um, is just more interesting from what we talked about last time as being proletariat fiction coming out in the same time frame and maybe speaking to a similar audience. But um, if we're looking at uh, narrative and plot, I think the movie has more to t- more to tell us. Uh, one thing that the the move watching the movie reminded me of that I had noted during reading the book, but I didn't bring up in last episode, is how similar this tale is to a lot of the crime fiction that we read that is about, especially about a robbery uh, where there's, Hey, a group of criminals get together. uh, They rob a bank or diamonds or whatever, what have you. And that happens in the first third or first half of the book. And then the rest of the book is about the fallout uh, amongst those characters um, about what happens after uh, you've, you've acquired this wealth. And this is essentially the same tale. And I guess that's where I see a lot of similarity uh, with crime fiction is the the aftermath of of the event that uh, that gets you the money. But no, I can't. <laughs> I'm talking around this subject. I can't pick between the film or the book. I think they're both good. I think they're both worth reading or watching, and both uh, worth putting in conversation with crime fiction. I think that's fair. I, I think you're right. Uh, different different strokes for different folks. I I think the the book is is deeper and it delves more into the socioeconomic and more of the the ethical terrain that Traven likes to explore uh, more of the philosophical stuff. Uh, but I think for if you want more of a sort of a nuanced emotional character experience, then the movie will take you there. And and I would probably go to the movie first uh, because uh, I'm drawn to character. But, but the Traven book sits with you as well uh, and, and for different reasons. So I think I'm going to watch the or uh, I wish I'm going to I'm going to read the Death Ship next. Uh, did they ever do a a good or worthy film adaption of that book, uh, if any, Kurt? So supposedly, yes, um, there is a cult classic film in Germany uh, based on the Death Ship. However, I have not figured out how to watch uh-huh. it yet. If any of our listeners know of a way to watch that movie, uh, preferably with some English subtitles, I would really appreciate the tip. But yeah, supposedly is well regarded, at, le- at least among a, some group of German yes. film fans. So if you are a German slash noir esthete and have access to secret film archives, uh, please share with us a, a copy of that disc. I think, I think Justin, of, of the untranslated material we've come across in this uh this show, that is one of my top things, as is the um, biography of Charles Williams that was only re- released in Spanish. Uh-huh. Uh, I would love to see a, a translation of that. Yeah, I, that would be great. I would, I, I'm curious to read that as well. Uh, I could try to translate it, but it'd be about 35 words. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but I, I did enjoy doing this comparison. I thought it was fun. Um, I thought it it felt really fresh to watch a film 
uh, right after recording um, the episode about the book and, you know, just, just gave it some more context. And if, you know, I would encourage our listeners, if you don't do this as a practice, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Especially with, with uh, two, you know, artifacts of, of such great quality. Not, this isn't always the case. You know, one thing we didn't bring up about this film, and I'll say this before, just before we, we close out here, um, but it is interesting to watch it again and see like how many references there are to this film in pop culture. You know, I think like probably the most famous thing is the we don't need no stinking yeah. badges, which has been quoted in a number of different things. But that, you know, that comes from this film. It's not even precisely the thing that we say in pop culture isn't, no, isn't no. what's said in the film. No. Just like uh, play it again, Sam isn't explicitly said in Casablanca. So that's, uh, as an interesting note, how we, it's like a game of telephone. We, we misremember these quotes and then they become cultural, you know, uh, artifacts. Yeah. That and just, um, I mean, I guess Bogart has been parodied so many different times or copied so many different times. That some of that comes from this. Um, but the other thing is for me as a fan, at least as a kid of the original Indiana Jones films, it's very difficult to not see Dobbs in mm -hmm. this and see, um, see some Indiana Jones coming through here. Yeah. Well, we know all about the relationship between the Maltese Falcon and, and Star Wars. So yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of Bogart yep. and a lot of, uh, a lot of the sure. adventure action films that, that, that Gen Xers and, and millennials cut their teeth on in the seventies and eighties. So, all right. Well, uh, I'm satisfied. Uh, any, any last words, Kurt? No, I think that's it. Thank you. This turned into almost a full length episode, but, um, Thanks for coming along on the journey with this one with us. Um, next time, we're going to be talking about Swag by Elmore Leonard. Um, and then we're going to figure it out. We don't quite know what's going to be the episode after that. But next time, it'll be Swag. Yep, swag it is. I've listened to it three times. I'm pretty excited about a conversation. That book is, is really speaking to me right now. So until then. That's good. Yeah, until then, um, if you want to get in touch with the show, you can send us an email at pointblanknoir at gmail.com. You can find us at on Facebook uh, at Point Blank, Hard Boiled Noir and Detective Fiction. Two pages there, one for the show, one is a group. The group kind of talks about a whole bunch of things under the umbrella um, of crime fiction. Uh, not a ton of traffic there, but, you know, a couple posts a, a week. Um, and, oh, we also have a Patreon if you want to kick us a couple of bucks. We do appreciate that. And as always, reviews of the show, especially positive reviews of the show, are greatly appreciated um, on iTunes or any other place you can review podcasts. So goodbye for now. And we'll, we'll see you next time. Adios. Point blank is under a creative commons license. Music is by Justin. Copywritten works are property of their respective holders.